Mr. Chairman, I want to be clear. Um, we need infrastructure. Uh, we need an infrastructure bill, whether it's roads and bridges, it's traffic solutions, it's flood protection, it's coastal resilience, it's broadband, it's ports and waterways, or airports. Uh, I, I imagine the folks in Arkansas and Tennessee would tell you what happened you know, to Interstate 40 there where the bridge got shut down. That didn't affect Republicans or Democrats differently. The hurricanes and tropical storms pounding the Northeast didn't affect Republicans and Democrats differently. And my friend who just left from Colorado, the floods that he's experienced didn't affect parties any differently. This is something that's needed. I spent two hours with President Biden and Vice President Harris talking through infrastructure and how we get to a bipartisan bill, talking about our concerns, talking about our priorities, and had great discussions, had, had multiple follow-up phone calls with White House staff. Mr. Chairman, if you go back and you look historically at infrastructure bills dating back in 1991 to the ICT legislation, there were 343 I votes and only 83 that were opposed. T21 in 1998, 337 yes votes and 80 no votes. In 19, uh, excuse me, in 2005, the Safety Lou Bill, 417 yes votes and only nine voting in opposition. Only nine. MAP 21 in 2012, 293 I votes, 127 no. I want to be clear. This was in uh, when, when uh, Chairman DeFazio was, was in the minority. He voted yes. And the FAST Act in 2017, 2015, 372 I votes to only 54 no votes. This House process that Speaker Pelosi designed was a failure from the beginning. They abandoned the bipartisanship approach that has been so successful over decades and decades. And let me be clear, I serve on the Transportation Committee, I've watched these markups go on for decades, and this process was unlike any I'd ever seen. For example, last Congress, over 148 amendments filed by Democrats. When I spoke to them, asked them what was going to be in this bill, they couldn't even tell us. 148 amendments filed in the committee, just by committee members, by Democrats. And of course, over 182 amendments filed by Republicans that were similarly left out of this legislation. In this Congress, 177 Republican amendments and 58 Democrat amendments and hundreds more on the floor in each instance. This legislation includes failed Green New Deal policies that have resulted in the opposite of the intended outcomes meaning adversely affecting the United States energy security, adversely affecting our national security, driving up, not down prices, driving up, not down global emissions, uh, and having an adverse impact on energy, having an adverse impact on the global environment. Partisan efforts don't just affect uh, the, the infrastructure, meaning the partisan efforts on this infrastructure bill don't just affect infrastructure, it affects inflation, which affects virtually everyone. Earlier this year, we did a $1.9 trillion package that was designed to be stimulus legislation. Every previous bill that we did under the banner of COVID was done in a bipartisan manner with strong bipartisan vote, not this one. It was done in a partisan manner that uh, spent $1.9 trillion. On top of that, we're now talking about $3.5 trillion. On top of that, we're talking about $1.2 trillion in this legislation. It increases the cost of all Americans and effectively has the impact of reducing their wages because of inflation, which is a hidden tax, which I'll note violates the president's commitment to not increase taxes on, on lower and middle income uh, earners. Mr. Chairman, in 2015, the FAST Act, legislation that many people sitting right here worked on and voted yes for, the bill was $305 billion during the Biden Obama-Biden administration, and it was hailed at the time as historic. Let me put that in perspective. $305 billion, just over the past, uh, during this COVID period, combined with the $90 billion for transit in this bill, we're talking about putting more for transit than half of that entire bill. They're talking about over $160 billion in transit, what has been done during COVID period in addition to the $90 billion. Here. Let, me, let me see if I can distill that a little bit more. Just the 69 or 70 billion that was previously appropriated, and we were told that that needed to be done because of the essential workers. Because of the essential workers. If you do the math, that provides 2.8 billion, 2.8 billion TNC rides or Uber Lyft rides, transportation network companies, 2.8 billion. If I remember the math on that, it would allow them 10 rides per week and somewhere between 18 and 20 months. 
And, 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 and transit systems are down, they're down to 10 to 20% of their usual ridership, yet we're putting even more money on top of them. Mr. Chairman, we're in COVID times. We don't know what this is going to look like. And I remember saying when that $1.9 trillion package was being debated, I said that. I said, look, we don't know if this thing's over. Now's not the time to pop the champagne corks and start spending money. We don't know what's going to happen. And look, look where we are now. My home state of Louisiana, some of the highest surges that we've seen nationally. And so what are we doing? We're putting $90 billion billion on top of it. We don't know the role that transit's going to play. We're trying to isolate people, not put them together. We have, we have entities that are doing 10 to 20% of the work they've done historically, and we're rewarding them with additional funding. I'm not sure this direction makes sense. I'm going to quote um, someone. You get the point like you do in your own private life. When you can afford to, uh, what, what you can afford to pay for. You want to make adjustments to the tax code? Are we still willing to be competitive? Can we compete in the global market? That was Senator Manchin, a Democrat senator from West Virginia. I never thought I would say this, but I preferred it when the Democrats considered Representative Pelosi to be the radical left and when $305 billion was a lot of money. We're talking about $7 trillion in spending. $7 trillion just with the $1.9 trillion package, the $3.5 trillion family package, and this $1.2 trillion package. Back in June, President Biden suggested that these bills be linked, the $3.5 trillion in the infrastructure bill. He, 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 just, he, he said that they needed to be linked together, inextricably linked, and what happened? Within about 15 hours, they backtracked because there was bipartisan attacks on it, yet rather than learning from Learning from that mistake, the, 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 the pushback from the American public that that was a failed path, that America didn't want to see a partisan path on infrastructure. What did Speaker Pelosi do? She actually doubled down on that very strategy that was rejected by the American people, that was rejected by the Biden White House. Rather than learning from those mistakes, <clears throat> we'll not consider voting for a budget resolution until the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act passes the House and is signed into law. Another quote, we're firmly opposed to holding the president's infrastructure legislation hostage to reconciliation. I couldn't agree with those statements more, but they're not mine. Those are statements from uh, Congressman uh, Gottheimer, Congressman Bordeaux, Congressman Vela, Congressman Golden, Congressman Quaylar, Congressman Gonzalez, Congressman Case, Congressman Costa, and Congressman Schrader. I couldn't agree with them more. When you have roads and bridges crumbling to hold back and use it as a political football, I just don't understand, Congressman Gottheimer. But it's really wrong to tie a bill that's been completed and passed in a bipartisan way out of the Senate with a bill that just has top-line numbers and no details, Congresswoman Murphy. We cannot wait. Everyone knows time kills deals, Congresswoman Bordeaux. Proceedings in the House today, this is a quote from today, proceedings in the House today will have no impact. Senator Sinema will not support a budget reconciliation process that costs $3.5 trillion. Mr. Chairman, we know where this is going. It's not going anywhere in the Senate. We, we have roads and bridges that are crumbling, as Congressman Gottheimer said. My home state, our coast, we've lost over 2,000 square miles of our coast. That's like wiping the state of Rhode Island off the map. We have an environmental and ecological crisis. We have a, a, a human crisis in terms of sustainability of our communities and our economy. And we're sitting here fighting over something that historically has not been a partisan battle. What we're seeing right now is a lack of leadership. I went earlier through the long history of bipartisanship for infrastructure bills. The Democrat infrastructure bill this year, 221 to 201. That doesn't reflect the bipartisan history. Last year, 233 to 188. The reality is that the late chairman, John Dingell, was right on when he said, the other party's the opposition. The U.S. Senate is the enemy. Mr. Chairman, we've got a long history of working together. Let's develop a bipartisan House position and work to try and, and ensure that our senators uh, have their say and our House members have their say. We're able to work together to come up with a package. The lack of leadership we're seeing right now results in Chairman DeFazio, as has been widely reported with his comments, being on the sidelines, watching the development of a bill without his input. I mentioned that the 2015 FAST Act highway bill was called historic. 
Gem Democrats have chosen a different type of, quote, historic in this case. They've chosen to go partisan on infrastructure for the first time. Let me be clear. This is entirely the result of the Democrats' decision to go partisan on this legislation. The Senate simply would have, has dismissed the House bill, which has re relegated all House members to the sidelines. There's not a House position. There's not a respectable House position that's being taken into consideration. Mr. Chairman, the Senate bill does have some good components in it. I'll give them that. They did. They, they worked through and had some good components. But we must keep in mind that the investment of taxpayer funds on infrastructure investments only makes sense when there's a federal nexus, there's federal interest in the investments, there's appropriate criteria. We've witnessed this administration abandon those investment principles for vague often unquantifiable goals that are not grounded in statute. I'm going to say that again. That are not grounded in statute. Inventing new criteria that's not grounded in statute. The Department of Transportation earlier this year hijacked the infra and build pro programs by effectively replacing investment criteria in the law with environmental justice, racial equity, and climate change. Under the Senate bill, they quadrupled the investments in these programs. Mr. Chairman, I've spent much of my life building infrastructure projects, everything from environmental to roads and bridges. This is a failed approach. You can't quantify or even remotely compare different metrics on those three categories to how you can use other types of cost to benefit returns for those investments. Things like saving time in traffic, reducing fuel consumption, saving time for those motorists trying to get to school, get to doctor's appointments and others. The Corps has been directed to not make any investments that may reduce the cost of consumption of conventional fuels. What does that mean, to reduce the cost of consumption? In my home state, we have flood protection projects. Does that mean gas stations and refineries have to be flooded? Is that what that means? Because that's what it appears the provision means. Now, let me say that again. You can't reduce the cost of consumption of conventional fuels with any Corps of Engineer dollars. Boy, have they succeeded. We've already seen gasoline prices, according to AAA, go up a dollar a gallon to $3.17 is what the average American is paying. Coming from an energy producing state, let me say that budget criteria another way. The Biden administration's policies are intentionally designed to increase the cost of energy for all Americans. In closing, Mr. Chairman, putting infrastructure at risk because the existing highway programs expire at the end of next month. By waiting this long, the Democrats threaten to not just prevent increased investment in infrastructure, but to actually result in those funds being cut off. We have a lot of work to do before the end of this fiscal year. We don't have the time to do it. There was $6 trillion in bipartisan COVID relief last year. Democrats are pushing $7 trillion in entirely partisan spending this year, which translates to over $50,000 per household. Is this how those households would like their money spent? Has anybody asked them? Let me put it in perspective. If we spend a dollar every single second, it would take well over 200,000 years to spend it. That's beyond irresponsible. We don't have to politicize the real needs of America. With so much uncertainty in the world today, one thing is certain. We must unite and pass a critical priority of the American people. Improving our nation's infrastructure, this is not about party or politics. It's about what's doing right for the country. That's a quote of Senator Joe Manchin. Mr. Chairman, I, um, I urge that we uh, re-engage in bipartisan approach to infrastructure, that we not inextricably link these bills together when we know where this is going to land in the Senate, and we resume to addressing the true priorities for the American people. Yield back.